Austin. Uh, my name is Richard. I grew up in Penn. Uh, started in kitchens and hospitality when I was 14. Um, working in restaurants and whatnot. Uh, always thought that things would be better, you know, better produce, stuff like that. Didn't find that that was the case, so decided I'd kind of do something about it myself. Steve was walking in every Friday with his microgreen box and his tucked in shirt. <laughs> where, you, where were you working? Where are you working? Uh, in the fish at the pier. Um, so I see Steve's sort of ethos and what he was starting and like really good organic local based kind of food, direct to the consumer, really consistent, really good product consistently. Um, so I thought like, I'll come by, have a look through what he's doing and work with him for a little bit. In that journey, kind of figuring out what I'd do myself, so I looked into different sprouts and <laughs> baby vegetables and niche sort of farming. Uh, that, uh, the mushrooms that we're getting in sometimes were from China and from Korea, which I thought wasn't very appropriate. <laughs> so I decided, what can we do to sort of do, do something about that? So now our ethos is to use whatever waste products that we have to um, as the mushroom growing substrate and then take those mushrooms direct to the consumer and to the restaurants themselves. Um, so as you can see, a couple of containers up the top, we've ramped up everything quite a bit now. <laughs> so yeah, we're looking in the, in the next couple of months, we'll be supplying, wholesaling and doing everything. Um, always done the lab work, things like that. Um, we've got a dedicated lab there and a big autoclave, all the rest of it, so <laughs> exciting times ahead. Uh, what I'd like to put out for you guys is maybe if you guys are mushroom lovers and do a lot of foraging and stuff like that, yeah. like always interested in new species, probably don't go eat them yourself, but we can get them lab tested. <laughs> There's a couple of places that I've heard of um, that you can send them off to to get them um, DNA sequence and stuff like that. Um, so really looking for like medicinals around here and some edibles. There's mm. already been a shiitake found, there's potentially reshi's found. There's definitely ones that look so much like reishi up in yeah. Gentry that we'd love to get so tested. So I'm going to get one this week yeah. from a guy and get it um, tested out and see if it is actually the right species or if it's yeah. a subspecies, if it has the medicinal benefits of it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Uh, yeah, that's basically, yeah, in a in a nutshell what we're doing and how you got us. And what do you got here? Uh, they're just some um, oyster mushrooms. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, it looks so real when you look yeah. into them. They're, yeah. mushrooms. they're um, a little bit young. Um, I'm still just dialing in that section up there, but um, yeah, they'll they'll about double in size by tomorrow still. So they'll be picked tomorrow. So <laughs> yeah, pretty quick, pretty awesome. So. Yeah, any uh, questions that you guys have? Do they have to be grown in plastic? Does it affect it? So part of the ethos. <laughs> To reuse mm -hmm. stuff, right now we are using polypropylene bags because they're autoclave, they're sterilized. Um, we're looking into potential for um, a quartz starch bag with a filter patch, just because they need to breathe. Um, so we're going to get a corn starch bag and then you can just throw the whole bag in the compost and have it all break down. Uh, there is other methods of container growing, bucket growing and stuff like that. That could be a potential option as well. But yeah, I think the, the corn starch bag is definitely something that is, yeah, high on our priority list to get that, get that sorted out. Um, yeah, we've got the means to um, just pasteurize and do it. It's a slightly different method. Yeah. So at the moment, they've only found they've extracted an enzyme that eats like pet bottles and stuff like that, and polyethylene plastics. Because these are made of polypropylene, it doesn't break them down. It's different structure of plastic, but definitely, yeah, definitely the road that we're going down. <laughs> Apparently cornstarch as an alternative to plastic bags is only more sustainable when they also get recycled. Reused. Yeah, so, so we will be composting them on site as well, and the bags don't really go out. We'll do bag sales later, and whoever we sell it to will be responsible for composting them. Um, but all the, so we don't sell this, we just pick them and sell them as a picked cut product sort of thing. Um, and then, so we're responsible for all the composting, so we'll make sure that we get composting down. So, yeah, right now we're just um, ripping the bags open and taking the substrate out. 
Yeah. Just break that down, and then the bag's going to plastic. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. So it's not ideal, but we're working on you know, mm -hmm. just getting the ball rolling to make everything better as we do it, just scaling up and supplying. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Questions? What's the, what's the life cycle? Like, is it like 72 hours? Or? Uh, from the mushrooms growing. <laughs> oh. Yeah, uh, these are about two days old. Yep. So about three days for the mushrooms. That's from the point of inoculation? No, so from the point of inoculation, uh, you'll see this bag is pretty much colonized. There's a tiny bit on the bottom. So from inoculation, these oyster mushrooms take about two weeks. And then you can rip open the bag and then you start getting fruit out. So potentially in three weeks, sometimes if there's um, slightly different temperatures or populations or the moisture content, you know, all those little things aren't quite right. They'll take a little bit longer. Uh, so you might be a four week turn around. Mm -hmm. Better than a radish. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, all the times basically in the lab work to build up the culture. Okay. To then transfer it for that, you know, that quick run and through yep. so, yeah. The rest of the time is um, tissue culturing and building up your spawn bank, you know, having up to not play it. But once that's all going, then you just need to go on top of it. Um, oysters are the quickest and we've got 15 different cultures of different oysters, so different whites and blues and pinks and yellows and browns and Whoa. things like that. Just the culture bank of them. Um, so you've got a lot of nice photos on your um, Facebook yeah. and website, hey? So, so everybody could connect name is in. Tans Exotic Mushrooms. Um, there's an Instagram page and there's a few photos up there. Oh. I should put more up there. <laughs> Sounds as colourful as the room in there. The yeah, different, different colors. Have a little look, check it out. Uh, the Instagram's really satisfying because it's just a cluster of all the different photos together. Yeah, so yeah. There's pretty much a variety of everything that we've grown, except I don't think there's a king oyster mushroom up there. But yeah, there's basically one or two of each. each thing. Are, you, are you only doing oyster mushrooms? The reason I started was with my mom's garage. <laughs> Before I was selling them or anything, I was just like, ah, I'll just test this out and see how it goes. Did you start with pink oyster mushrooms? It, pinks were in there, pinks and whites. Uh, the first mushrooms that I cultivated were just a, a white oyster mushroom. So the whites and um, some blues that were actually all blue. Now the ones that I grow are just a blue cap. Um, but yeah, you can get all blue oysters and stuff like that, which are pretty insane. <laughs> yeah, it looks, it must look really freaking. We do kind of have to work with the seasons a little bit as well. Um, because a lot of like um, some of the blues and some shiitakes and stuff like that, they really like that cold shot. They really like to get really cold, and it does get cold up here in the winter. So the winter time, next winter, hopefully we'll have a whole array of different super funky sort of things. So yeah, we should do another pictures. like open day or something when yeah. that's happening. So next year, hopefully, we'll have an, an open day for the mushroom side of it as well, and have everybody up there and yeah, yeah. take you through sort of what you can do. We'll put a window in the lab and all the rest of it. So, yeah, you can kind of look into it and see. Awesome. Yeah. So how are you finding the people, like in the restaurant and everything, taking them up? You know, what are the responses? It's, yeah, you get that excitement when you take them a box of mixed pink and yellow and blue and grey oysters, which is really exciting. Um, people are really taking them on, like um, the restaurants that I have direct connections to, we just take them on straight away. And, so keep using them consistently. If not, um, they'll just make specials out of them. And so, yeah, there's definitely more potential. That's why we've scaled up everything because we've had that that yeah, enthusiasm from people. Like we want more of this. We want 10 kilos of this. We want 15 kilos of this a week. Just you know, in certain places, it's like, oh, that's amazing. So <laughs> that's what we're looking at. Yeah, and, yeah and scale up to supply all those people consistently. And like. Um what you were saying about the fungal community, like us being fungal community, and I just see like you and Steve really passionate about what you're doing, creating, you know, from little things, big things grow, and yeah. just really beautiful to see all of this flourishing. And then can you imagine these beautiful sprouts and these beautiful mushrooms on the plates together, you know? It's, it's just such an amazing, beautiful rainbow in my head right now, thinking about it, you know, it's so yeah. lovely. It's an exciting world. So yeah, for right now, we're focused on production and scale. And like I said, we want to get more and more culture bank up of the local species that we have here. And there's a lot of people interested. Um, so yeah, in the sort of medium to short term plan as well, um, we're going to start doing spawn sales directly to people. Then. Yeah. I know I did the workshop with Joe the other day and 
met um, the Vine Spawn from when in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. I don't remember where they are exactly, but it's down near Melbourne. And like we can we can grow that spawn here. So the same as what Steve was doing. We used to get product in the restaurant that was from Byron Bay. Somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Around Byron Bay. So it's traveling over fifteen hundred kilometers. Yeah. Yeah. So if we can we have the materials here, growing here locally. Yeah that we can put together and sell locally in our little funky network. Yeah, so thank you. Funky networks all the way down. Yeah. So one big funky network. Big funky. Kind of doing everything. Funky mycelium. Mycelium. <laughs> <My cell. laughs> yeah. Yeah, beautiful. That's great. I wanted to ask you, you mentioned about the foraging and the testing and stuff like that. Yeah. Is this something that has to be sent away, or is this something that you have yeah. part of the ability? So the first thing is, um, there's a lot of identification pages, um, websites, but also Facebook groups. So you can get it identified, and then when we're pretty sure that it's the right thing, just like this Reshi that um, this guy's found around here, we're, we're pretty sure it's the right thing. Then there's a lab that I know of down in Melbourne. Um, you can take a tissue culture and grow it out on a petri plate in the lab. Um, and then you send that down to the lab, and they test it for exactly what active match, compounds, what genome, yeah, exactly what species it is, yeah. Um, so that's what we're gonna like. I'm not just gonna culture anything from around here and sell it on the business. Yeah, other liability. Because as far as keeping it live, right? you get your species. Other culture, yeah, um, temperatures and stuff. Um, so once you, if you culture it onto like a petri plate, then you can kind of put that in the fridge. So that's the Stand kind of growing out process. <laughs> Normally, so I grow out all the spawn on grain, because grain's really nutrient dense. It's pretty, pretty common in the um, mushroom industry, because it's easy to transfer in the rest of it. When that grain gets transferred into something kind of sawdust or cardboard or um, straw based, because it has the right stuff in it to, to make good mushrooms, you know. So. Right now we're just using the local sawdust and the um, coffee grounds that we're picking up on the microgreen line. Um, and that's, that's the one we do. <laughs> and how about the health benefits of the mushrooms that you're choosing to grow? A lot of really good stuff in um, oysters. Shiitakes are amazing and then you can get into the medicinals as well, which have all of their own properties um, which are really cool and make extracts and things like that off them as well. Um, yeah, the, the hardwood sawdust and stuff um, has a lot of the nutrient that it needs to make those keys in the mushrooms. So, yeah. Mm. Anything local and fresh and organic is going to be the best for you as well. Because we know already, the longer our food travels coming up the coast to us, yeah. the more dead it is along the way. So, mm. yeah, it's a really big part of just picking it, you know, delivering it as quickly as we can, getting it out to the people in their bellies. <laughs> And is there very many local um, rainforest edible mushrooms that are... That's the thing. Tropical North Queensland has such a small network of <laughs> people and information. Right. Subtropics mm. has a lot of um, published papers, but the only one that I know of is a little booklet um, of three scientists that have made a little booklet of Tropical North Queensland, and that's all about identified species. That's it. Isn't that amazing? Uh, I'll get it for you later if you want Yeah. It's just, um, it's, yeah. I'll give you that name later. Are they all edible species in that book? Or was it? No, they were just yeah. identified yeah. as local tropical. Yep. Yeah, like I said, um, a guy from Melbourne records he found the um, native shiitake. It's one from the rural or something like that. And that's the one we kind of found here, which is interesting. Um, yeah, definitely needs to be more research and more like peer reviewed papers, more like really good backed, um, backed information published out and really yeah, well structured. And so, yeah, that's what we're working on to try and do. I have um, spoken work with a little bit of a um, mycologist in the JCU University, um, and we found when we went out with her, we found a quadriceps that was like packing a bee, a honey, a European honeybee which is like unheard of. <laughs> so yeah, we got to follow up that and kind of get those things out there and get names set? put on them and all the rest of it. Quarter sets. Quarter set? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was attacking, um, uh, I'm pretty sure it was a uh, honeybee. So that's kind of 
not really good, but it's happening, so... <laughs> it's usually they eat, is it caterpillars? Yeah, that's well? the thing, yeah. And it wasn't just one that we found, we found four bees in a two square meter sort of little area. So it was happening there, so... Yeah, lots of research like that that needs to be done and published and put out there and put a name on so that people know what's going on. So. Yeah, it's an exciting world, an exciting field, and once a bit more medicinal, um, the medicinal benefits are well known in the community, then it will just kind of keep going from there, keep rolling up from there. People have it in their everyday diet, like some people do now, very few people, and yeah, <laughs> the network. Well, I'd like to. <laughs> yeah. And there's a lot of people doing the superfood, like mushroom brews, for different. Um, Qualities for medicinal, like um, powdered mushrooms and all of that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, there's a few common ones. They say reishi's really good for mm -hmm. um, community, and quercus um, is really good for strength and vigor. Hey, take the there is only one commercial process that I know that is that it's commercial. Yeah, but it's like a